Happy birthday to you. Aloha on this beautiful day in May of 2019. We're at the Pacific Club with some guests today that you're going to enjoy as we talk about the rail. My name is Kehlidi Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute, and we have today with me a distinguished panel. To my right, if you'll give attention to the gentleman in the center, Professor Randall A. Roth, Professor Emeritus at the Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii. Randy is known for so much it's hard to reduce his resume, so I'll just give you one or two highlights. He's one of the co-authors of Broken Trust, which revealed the scandal behind the Bishop of State's Kamehameha schools, for which he became known internationally for his expertise on rail and I mean, <laughs> all kinds of uh, institutions. That's right. I'm jumping ahead of the game over here. In addition to that, uh, Randy has been known for his public policy work, which is gained a great deal of attention. Please give a big hand to Randy Ross. <laughs> Next to Randy is another professor at the University of Hawaii, a department chair in one of the engineering departments. He is an expert in his field and frequently testifies across the world. He has a phenomenal amount of writing he has done, and he is probably, if I dare say, one of the, if not the foremost expert on the nuts and bolts of the Honolulu rail system. He has from the beginning been very vocal about that issue, but he's also been vocal about other issues. And if you recall several years ago, he made several issues well known to the public by running for mayor of Honolulu. Please welcome to our program today, Panos Kavadaris. And finally, on our panel today, we have someone who worked for many years at the city council, or one of the city council persons. She managed to do that while raising her family, and finally decided that their, their daughters were old enough for her to launch out on her own and ran for office this last election, and she won a seat as a councilwoman on the Honolulu City Council. She's been doing incredible things since then, and one of her pet projects, which has been successful, has been securing the funding for a forensic audit of the rail. Please welcome Kai Tsumeyoshi. In addition to knowing them as public figures, I'm delighted to say that they're all dear friends, and today they're going to share their monomal and their wisdom with us. And you're going to have an opportunity to ask any questions that you want. So jot down some questions, and when we're all done, I'll invite you to come to the microphone over here at, on the stage so that those who are being broadcast to can also see you. Well, we're ready to begin, and if I could just have on a technical note, ask for some assistance on the microphone, which has a little bit of feedback. We're going to begin by asking each of our panelists to give us a four-minute opening statement. Now, that's going to be difficult because their wisdom is far beyond that. Each one of them is uh, tall and sweet. I'm just asking them in this comment for short and sweet. <laughs> we'll start with Randy Roth. As Randy and I have discussed the rail, one of the issues that he has concisely and insightfully understood is that the rail has produced and been to some extent the product of a certain kind of culture in Honolulu and in the state of Hawaii. He calls it the culture of deception. With that said, could you give us your opening remarks, Professor Roth? Thank you, Kalei. Um, you know, everybody has opinions on various policy issues. And especially when you're talking about big dollar infrastructure, uh, something like rail, for example, reasonable people can have different ideas as to what's the best way to go and, and how much is reasonable to spend and what sort of benefits we should require to, as an absolute minimum before committing public money. And one of the things that has concerned me greatly about this project from the very beginning is that instead of having uh, our elected officials engage in a robust discussion on that level of the policy issues, or the people who have been directly involved in building rail to get involved in the policy issues, instead they've been constantly, uh, and, and there's no softer word that I can think of that applies, but deceiving the public. It's one thing to put a happy face, a positive spin on what you're talking about, but from the very beginning, uh, our city leaders and various others involved in rail 
have, have deceived us. They deceived us about uh, what the likely cost would be. Uh, most of you are familiar, I'm sure, with the 2006 headline where the advertiser announced with an exclamation mark, rail to cost $3 billion, which in hindsight, of course, that was ridiculously low compared to what we know the reasonable estimate would be. That would be but boring, yeah. I would just remind you that at that time they were still talking about a 34-mile route, and they were saying it's going way up to $3 billion. The jobs that were promised, the completion date that was promised, uh, the impact on traffic congestion that was promised, the impact on transit-oriented development. That we, so from the very beginning, and it established what I would describe as a culture of, of deception, and it continues to today. The current executive director of, of HART um, has said that stopping at Middle Street would save $440 million. Well, actually, that's not what he said. What he said was that the critics have calculated that it was, say, $440 million. Well, that's absurd. Our number is way into the billions. And it's one thing to disagree as to what you think the dollar savings would be. That would be OK. But to take a ridiculously low, low number and attribute it to us, that is deceptive. To say for the last two years, on time, on schedule, nothing has changed, without explaining that that's because they canceled the bidding on the fourth segment for a number of reasons, totally misleading. In fact, what they are now telling the public on expected completion time and expected cost is different than what they're telling the FTA in the recovery plan. There shouldn't be two sets of information depending upon who your audience is. Um, the executive director said, you can't stop at Middle Street because that would violate the full funding grant agreement. Well. Flash alert, we violated the full funding agreement years ago. <laughs> so that's not the issue. Uh, and then finally, we're talking about forensic audit. There have been some great audits. The city audit pointed out that there aren't internal controls, that Hart wouldn't know if there was fra fraud, waste, or abuse, because they don't have the internal controls that could not just prevent it, but spot it if it were happening. The state audit, which is now coming out with its fourth installment, has been a terrific audit. But there hasn't been action. There hasn't been the politics hasn't been there. And it's just part of what I call a culture of deception. Well put. Thank you very much. As you've been tracking the rail, Professor Rock said that we were stunned to hear that it would cost as much as $3 billion. Now, that would be a bargain today. We're looking at nine billion plus, and when the costs come in, experts say it's going to be much more than that. We should have been riding the rail by now, but it's far from that place. So what does this mean? Have you encountered conversations where people have said it's just not productive to debate the rail? Are we just going to tear it down and start and just sell off the um, stands that are up right now, or use them for buses and so forth? We don't want to be negative here. We want to be solutions oriented. So I'm going to ask Professor Primadoras what the status of moving forward is. What options are there realistically at this stage for the Honolulu Rail? Thomas? Thank you, Kelly. Actually, I wanted to spend uh, four minutes, uh, my four minutes, to give you an update and particularly give you some specifics about the cost of this system uh, because we're looking at it and I have a one slide presentation if you can look. It's a lot of numbers, but basically I want to take the steps that we have taken so far. Um, we, we had Kiwi Pacific building the first 10 miles. My God, we got such a bargain out of it. They built 10 miles of rail for 568 million. Then 744 is the next segment. That's the one that takes us to Middle Street. That one is pretty much a done deal and it's getting done. Now the city wants to award the downtown section, Middle Street to Ala Moana. They're budgeting 1.3 billion, I'm budgeting 1.4 billion because nobody really knows, uh, close enough. Uh, then stations, 10 have been awarded and, and Hart has uh, uh, estimates for 11, 11. Then we have the rail yard who's been built and then we have also purchased about 80 trains. What's the total? 4.2 billion dollars. The project is getting done pretty much on the money. It's not bad. Then you add, of course, the soft cost change orders and finance charges. That takes us to $6.4 billion. That would have been so great. Remember, in 2008, when Mufi wanted the vote, 
Cliff and I were saying the cost of the rail would be 6.4 billion, not 4.6 that the city was saying. It would have been a great deal in how it would be done. However, that's only part of the picture because the rest of the picture goes like this. Um, yes, construction, so the construction people are not taking us for a ride. It's 4.2 billion. But then we have a fat design proportion, management, a lot of oversight layers there, a lot of change orders, oh, the pet thing for Hawaii, right? Uh, BS, this is what you and I call BS. I added the 10% there because there is a lot of that in there. And again, the finance charge, that takes us to 7.99 billion plus real estate, which is actually what Hart now says is going to cost, 8.3 billion dollars. But there is a lot of questionable costs in all that highlighted area. However, in the previous legislative, legislative session, the mayor, when was begging for more money, did say that actually the project is going to cost $10.5 billion. And I think that's the rock bottom cost of the rail. We'll be lucky if they go to one and finish it, finish it at $13 billion. So I have published these numbers and maybe in a small way uh, the FBI and the DOJ looked at these numbers and they said maybe there's something big there because that's the bottom line there. A $3.6 billion discrepancy. So uh, that's a big difference between the, what we could have done at $6.4 billion and the actual uh, price of about $10 billion. So I fully agree with uh, Councilwoman Chimeyosi that is calling for a forensic audit. There are a lot of things that special experts, not accountants, need to provide oversight and tell us how did we get all that three plus billion overage in the soft part because the scam is not in the hard part. We are getting pretty decent deal getting built, but then a lot of people are billing us for things that they're not happening out there. It's not construction, it's not trains, it's not uh, you know power stations or anything. So where is that discrepancy? So I'm going to leave you with that thought and then we'll talk in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pamela. Those of you who have followed the Grassroots Institute know that we've been heavily engaged with this issue, and these gentlemen have helped us analyze it through the years. One thing that we became aware of a few years ago is that our community was hotly divided between pro-rail and anti-rail, and it was becoming less and less productive to have debates pro-rail or anti-rail, especially as the project moved on. In fact, as a result of that, we sought at Grassroots Institute common ground that would bring people together. Now, some of my talents include standing in front of a microphone, but one of them is not writing rap music and performing it. So the staff never allowed me to perform a rap that I composed, but I will do so today. But only as, pro only as poetry, okay? Pro-rail or anti-rail, we're all the same. They're taking our money, and it's a shame. Hey, politician, lift the veil and audit rail, audit rail, audit the rail. Okay, how's that? <laughs> well, we launched a movement two years ago that called for audit the rail, and one of the ways we tracked it was to see the number of times that phrase occurred in media and came out from the voices of politicians, and it was massive. And there was one who was valiant and courageous who actually began to lead the charge. And as a result, after becoming a freshman council woman on the city council, she was able to get the city council to adopt a resolution and a bill to have a forensic audit. Aloha and mahalo, Dr. Akina and my fellow panelists and everyone who came today for your time in coming to discuss this very important issue. I'm so happy to meet all of you. So it's just a little background as to the resolution that I introduced um, in February, just one month after taking office. That resolution was Resolution 19-29. Initially, that resolution was calling for the, um, the uh, forensic audit, and that was to be conducted by the HART Board. And um, there was some pushback from the HART Board, of course, about doing a forensic audit under their um, oversight. So then there was an amendment to the resolution to bring that um, discretionary power back to the Honolulu City Council. So I was very happy that in March 
um, this council did adopt resolution 19-29, which calls for the initiation of a forensic audit for the rail project, which will be initiated by the Honolulu City Council. And there was a number of reasons why I thought this was so important. As mentioned, I was just elected in January, and so it's my first term in office, and it was a very different uh, occupational change for me. My background has always been in community service, and I've worked with at-risk youth in our communities. I've worked in homeless and transitional shelters, and I also worked in the women's prison. And in every place I ever worked, I saw that the challenges of our people are very, very real, and that there needs to be a shift in what's happening here in our island home to be able to make it affordable for people to live here. I worked with a lot of families who work two or three jobs and are working really hard just to make ends meet. And as a counselor, saw the devastating effects it has on children when you're living in a household that's just so stressed out by financial stressors. Um, also, as a mother of two, I have two daughters. My older one will be graduating from college this weekend, uh, March 12th. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's a big accomplishment. So as a mother of two, my older one will be 22 in September. My younger one is 19. I really felt going into political office, my main concern is to really advocate for the people and make sure that people's voices are heard. And I felt that one of the most, um, the most difficult challenges we have facing us is the rail project, just because of the extreme cost overruns that we've seen and the long-term effects to taxpayers. So I introduced a resolution really to show that we're serious about getting answers for the people. I felt that the forensic audit was the way that we needed to go because as been noted, there's been um, previous audits done, but those were really snapshots in time and was not a forensic audit, which really looks to the purposeful, possibly purposeful breaches of internal control. And as mentioned earlier, the issues that we're having are in soft costs that are well hidden from even the city council. For many, many years, the city council has been asking what has happened to all this money, because as shown, with the construction, there's um, hard costs that you can account for, but there's so many other costs that we haven't been able to account for. So the forensic audit is to get those costs. I'm proud to say that the city council has rallied behind the resolution also with the inclusion of money in our upcoming budget for that audit. So we are on track to actually get it done. And so I'm very hopeful for that and hopeful to get those answers that we need for the public, especially now that we are moving into the next phase, which is recommended for public-private partnership, or the P3, I think if we don't get to the root cause as to why money has been spent the way it's spent, we will never be a better um, stewards of the taxpayers' money until we get to the root cause of why taxpayers' money has been spent with such irresponsible ways in the city. So hoping for that, and thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. Well, thank you. Thank you. Before you come up and ask your questions, and I hope you're prepared to do that by coming to the microphone soon, I'd like to ask some follow-up questions of our panelists. First to Randy Roth. Randy, you mentioned a culture of deception, but you're very familiar with dealing with cultures of deception in your work on Bishop Estates for Mega Man Schools, which came out in the book Broken Trust. You chronicled how institutions can deceive the public, and you wrote about fraud, waste, and abuse. I know you're going to be careful because you have a legal background and are a law professor, but are we looking at fraud and criminality here? Or how would you talk about fraud and abuse in terms of the rail system at this stage? One of the problems uh, in analyzing what has happened with the rail project is that there has not been a minimum level of transparency that you would expect from any sort of a public project. Strangely enough, heart board members have complained that they didn't have the minimum information that they needed in order to provide oversight. Uh, Les Condo, the state auditor, who is just today issuing the fourth installment on his audits, uh, pointed out that there is, I'll say, confusion. He said it was attributed to confusion. Whether that's the case or if it was more intentional, I don't know. But for years, the director of HART took the position basically that information going to the board was up to him as to what they would see or not see. Even the decision on going P3 for the final installment uh, was initially determined to be something that could be decided at the staff level and not determined by the HART board. So there is a, a type of, of 
secrecy. It goes beyond just not a minimum level of transparency, a level of secrecy that reminds me of what was going on at the trust that then we called Bishop Estate, now we call it Kamehameha Schools. And you have to have a reasonable level of, of transparency. The audits that have been done were terrific. Uh, nothing was done with the results. The forensic audit is different than the ones that have been done. Hopefully it will discover some information that hasn't yet been discovered. The FBI is engaged in the federal criminal investigation, which overlaps a bit with what a forensic audit is all about. So hopefully we're going to have more information sometime down the road. The problem, of course, is that that will be after billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars have been spent. So I come back to the sense that from the very beginning something has been wrong and I think it can be traced to a dysfunctional political culture and I think Heidi is a breath of fresh air but the city council should collectively hold their heads in shame at the way this has been allowed to unfold over the years. Well, thank you, Randy. And now let me ask Thomas a follow-up question. That was a very good overview you gave us of the costs of the rail since the beginning and the economy that we've lost. But now as we turn our attention to the question, what do we do now? There is a proposal to stop the rail at Middle Street. And as Randy pointed out earlier, some have attributed a price tag of $450 million or savings of $450 million. Now, what do you think about this, about that proposal and about the numbers that are actually involved in the cost? Well, clearly the $400 million is a, a made-up number that means nothing because the city is budgeting $1.3 billion for the PPP partnership to finish that segment. So at a minimum, the savings of that, plus over this or whatever. So we're talking at least a $2 billion savings. So what is the best solution right now that we're so far in because Two, three years ago, it would have been a good idea to completely scrap it. But we're quite past that point. However, we have practically reached the airport, a short segment to Middle Street. Middle Street is our intermodal center by design since the early 2000s. It's supposed to be spinning all the passengers, collecting and spinning out, like a hub and spoke. That was why we spent the big bucks to do it. So terminating the rail there, it's actually an excellent idea. Because from there, you can have express electric buses to downtown, buses to Alamoana, and buses via the freeway to the UH, something that the rail will never do, not at least in another 10, 20 years. So Middle Street actually can be a win, win, win. Excellent public transit connection, and save us a couple of billion dollars. Well, thank you very much, Thomas. And now, Heidi, I want to follow up on your forensic audit. And do you ever hear people say, we have audit fatigue? I mean, there are audits right and left. The rail has gone through financial audits, it's gone through federal audits for compliance, um, it has gone through city and county audits, it's gone through state legislative audits, and we have four of those that have just come out, including one that was released today. And so your critics have sometimes charged, we're doing so many audits, why do we need another audit? And won't it just be a waste of so my question to you is, how is the forensic audit you're calling for different from the other audits? What are the goals of it and what is it going to accomplish for the future? Thank you for that question. And yes, there have been those who have said that there is that sense of audit fatigue, that we have had so many audits done in the past. But um, like I was saying earlier, those audits were done in snapshots in time. The forensic audit that we're calling for, the city council now that we have brought it under our purview, we're going to be um, spelling out what are the qualities of the investigator that we want to have looking into this issue. And so it is going to be more of a, more depth of investigation, and it is looking specifically to any purposeful breaches of internal controls, which um, based on all the audits we've ever had, um, dating all the way back to 2009, the um, lack of internal controls has come up on every single audit, which really prompted me to request for the forensic audit, because like was said earlier, even after all the audits were done and every audit said lack of internal controls, we still have not seen any action taken to improve those internal controls. So with a forensic audit is looking specifically to that and the city council is going to be looking to putting in the scope of the investigation and what we're really looking for. And the reason why I feel it is so important is because of the fact that moving into this public-private partnership or the 
proposals for that is if we do not find out why we made such bad decisions early on, those bad decisions will continue. And if you've been following the committee meetings lately, I've been very vocal about having strong reservations and concerns about the P3 because of the operation and maintenance component, which I believe we need, again, very much more transparency on because we cannot have this as a sweetener to the deal for the last portion, which was indicated that there, it has been noted that it will cost $1.3 billion to finish that final segment under the P3 project. But what's been lacking is there's also a 30-year operation and maintenance award to that same person. So I feel that we need to be very transparent as to what the cost is because you can't say it's only 1.3 for the construction when they are also going to be awarded the 30 years of operation and maintenance. So um, to your question, um, the forensic audit is really to drill down to find out what has happened to get really good questions answered about the responsibility or lack thereof to the taxpayers of the city and county of Honolulu and to make sure that we're treating our taxpayers' dollars the way it should be treated and that is with um, full disclosure and transparency as to what is being spent on. Well, thank you. And I'm going to follow up with some questions about the P3 public-private partnership. But first, I want to make sure that all of you who would like to ask some questions have that opportunity. And so we have a microphone over there. My Executive Vice President Joe Kent will help you come to the microphone and simply state your name and concisely ask your question. Because of the time, we won't have time for any speeches. And I'll ask my panelists also to uh, uh, be very concise. So go ahead and line up. Let's have several people line up. And as you're lining up, let me throw a question out to the panelists. Public-private partnerships have become a buzzword, P3. It seems to be the magic bullet to solve problems. There are good ones and there are bad ones. And you know the Grassroot Institute has researched this and gone on media to point out the difference between a healthy public-private partnership and a an unhealthy one. In a healthy one, like the one that has now taken over at the Mali hospitals and is saved from the bankruptcy, you've got a great deal for the people. You, you, you let the private sector take the financial burden, and they have an incentive to make it work. But we're concerned about the rail, because it looks like this may not be so great a deal for the people, that this public-private partnership may leave taxpayers in Hawaii holding the bag. Because while at the front end, businesses may put in the money, they really don't have the incentive to, to make their money off of the rail. They can deliver any kind of project whatsoever. So they don't take the same level of risk, nor do they have the same incentives that good public-private partnerships would have. Any of your thoughts on the P3? Heidi, you had some initially. Randy and Thomas? Well, I was just going to say, and it's just my way of, of saying what, what Heidi has already said quite nicely from her standpoint. From my standpoint, the P3 is all about confusing exactly how much it's going to cost to finish building rail. Because you've got this component that Heidi has pointed out, 30 years of operation and maintenance money, a huge amount of money, and how much you allocate of the total contract to finishing rail and how much you allocate to operation and maintenance is basically an accounting decision. And so I see it as, as deceptive at its core and am assuming the worst in terms of how they will use that in order to fool the public as to what it would cost to finish rail. Well, I'll tell you something that I, I have first-hand experience. There was a disgruntled engineer working the project that left for the mainland and he called me and we had a long talk. He is still in support of the project. He thinks it's a good project, but it's done very poorly, he said. And he has first-hand experience of specific tasks having 10 bosses. 10 people oversigning one, uh, over, having oversight over one task. That's really 10 payments for the same thing. This is one of the things that a good PPP will not do. PPP really has strict guidelines and strict, you know, line of command and basically it comes to, if it's a good PPP, it has one box that makes critical decision for the critical path. And that's how a lot of projects get delivered with PPP on time and on budget, but some of them <coughs> suffer on the other end as being not profitable. This is definitely a different project, will never be profitable, so their profit will be our taxes. <coughs> so Randy is uh, quite correct in saying that eventually we won't get fleeced. The advantage of it is that we're going to get 1.3 billion in advance because that's what a PPP does. The banks and the joint venture comes 
first and they front the money, you build a thing and then they build you for 30 years. So, uh, well, that sounds like a high interest credit card. Or that's right. That's card. exactly what it is. Heidi, any last thought on that? Just that same concern about it, not knowing exactly the cost, and in committee meetings did ask about what that cost is for the 30 years of operation and maintenance, and so we're told that those numbers aren't specifically available yet, so I'll be keeping asking that question, and we'll figure out what that number is shortly, hopefully. Thank you very much. Now, our panel has done a great job, and they are all yours now. Give them a hand. We have such a long line of people who are ready to ask questions. This must be a fascinating topic because public speaking in front of other people is usually a frightening thing. But if you don't help out, we can get everybody in. So state your name and then just ask a question. No speeches. But first, my good friend Ken Skullin. Ken. How do you do? My name is Ken Skullin. It seems to me that in Hawaii there's a tremendous lack of appreciation for the virtues of competition. In, comp in communication, 40 years ago, they ended the government monopoly and we got an astounding uh, competition in communication that allowed us all kinds of things that were changed. In transportation, however, Cliff Slater pointed out to me that in 1940, 80 years ago, Public Utilities Commission outlawed all the multitude of buses and jimmy competition in transportation we had in the state. So we haven't had competition for, 40, for 80 years. And I'm wondering, isn't there a better way to allow more competition in the bus with a multitude of, of alternatives that could be provided than another government project. And I really don't trust public-private partnerships. That's uh, a, a prescription for, for corruption. Very good, good question. Anyone can well, it's an excellent question, and we have seen some of the change already. Uh, the number one now enemy, so to speak, of public transit is the TNCs, the Ubers and Lyfts of this world. That eventually, that essentially, they do provide what the equivalent rides. You take a ride in the bus, you take a ride in the Uber. Two, three people in an Uber can be cheaper than a bus. And since the last three, four years that Uber and the similar services have had an exponential growth, the share of public transit nationwide has almost halved. So we are actually building a system that is today obsolete, let alone 10, 20 years uh, in the future when the Googles of this world, they may even come up with autonomous pods that they will enable even the people who don't drive to take rides. You don't even have to take your kids to school. The pod will take them to school. The pod will take me to work. No need for parking, etc., etc. So transportation is going to be revolutionized in the next 20, 30 years, not by rail or mass transit. So we have, we have lost that train, literally. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Fonis. Now my former chairman of the Board of Youth for Christ, Terry Wastra. Terry, welcome. Thank you, Kaylee. I'm Terry Wastra, and as I am sitting here, a comment comes to mind before I ask the question, and that was of the old ancient Senator Everett Dirksen, when he said, a billion here and a billion there, pretty soon you're talking some real money. And <laughs> I think that sounds like what we're, having, what we're into here in, in the rail. My question might be mostly for uh, Panos. Uh, he was, actually, he was at my home, and I forgot to ask him that question at the time. But was there any effort made to put some private money into this project when it was planned? There were many of us totally opposed to it, but nobody listened. And were there people that were making offers of private investments? That's my question. And it's a good one. And uh, Mufi tried to bluff with it. Uh, remember when I was running against it, and I actually asked him point blank, how much Alamana Shopping Center is putting into it? You are gifting them a station. You are going to bring in passengers theoretically by the thousands. How much are they putting in? 3,000, 30,000, 3 million dollars? Zero, folks. Nobody's touching this thing with a 10-foot pole. You know, at best, we're going to recover 30 cents out of every dollar of cost, and zero of the construction cost. I mean, that's, a, that's the fair box recovery of operations, right? With 30 cents out of the dollar of the cost and none of the construction cost. So it's a service. A lot of people say, you know, we've got to have it. Like, we have libraries. Libraries never make money. Yeah, but then nobody would invest in that, right? Because there is no way of getting your money back. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Next up, we have Bob. You want to introduce yourself? Yeah, Bob here. I, in a former life, I was an executive at One Electric Industries as director of business development. I was also appointed uh, to the first rail uh, at uh, to the downtown rail station for the first rail. And we built this rail from town out before Copley was built. Things might have been a little better. Pontus and I both ran, he ran for mayor, I ran for city council against Tulsi. I got 650 votes or 14,400. So I knew right then that wasn't for me. <laughs> However, I have written, I think, two to three articles, and I'm looking at one of them, about stopping at Middle Street. It is an absolute perfect location to get on uh, express buses to where you're going. Who is going to go all the way to Alan Wong Center? Who's going to get on their car? Number one, who's going to ride it? That scares me. Because if you're out in Compile and you've got a family that goes to school in town, you've got jobs all, you're going to get your car parked at Compile, get on the rail, get off at Elmont Center. Bob, that's a great insight. I'm wondering if you could. Ask and the point question. is, I'm worried about climate change. And the question I have for Randy is will the feds listen to us on the climate change issue with uh, tidal incursion into? downtown, the downtown station area, and uh, will they go along with uh, stopping at Middle Street? Is there any chance? Do you Thank have any you. Clue? Interesting question. Go ahead, Randy. Yeah, I, I don't know what the feds would or, or wouldn't do, but the, the FTA, the Federal Transit Administration, uh, has been complicit in this debacle, and that's the word from the Wall Street Journal article, this debacle, uh, from the very beginning. They got pressured into going along with it by Senator Dan Inouye at the time. Uh, we have emails that so we got through discovery in the federal lawsuit where we know they were emailing each other at the FTA describing the uh, inability of the city to, to do what it was trying to do and that it, it would deceive without remorse. And I could go on and on, but the point is that the FTA is complicit in this debacle. And so one of the reasons why we've said if we stop at Middle Street, we aren't going to have to give back any money to the FTA. There are other reasons, but one is that they have statutory oversight responsibility, which they have failed miserably. They are complicit in this whole thing. So that kind of changes the, the starting point when you are trying to anticipate what the feds, what the FTA might do on any particular Issue. And I'll leave it at that just because a good answer would take longer than, yeah. than we have time for. Uh, the other thing I. Uh, you could ask quickly, Bob. I appreciate that. I'm going to wind up now, but I researched that this is the most expensive project per capita per person ever. Yes. Thank you very much, Bob. And as we have fewer and fewer Hawaii people staying in Hawaii, that cost goes up. <laughs> Rob Burns. Rob Burns. Oh, no. Anyway, I. I been here a long time. Uh, my family has. In fact, we should. Only 66, but <laughs> maybe Rob, we should have called the the rail and what you named the company you founded, Local Motion. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a graduate of University of Hawaii, and um, top of my class, University. Get it? University. Yeah. <laughs> so I do everything simple. So I look at other projects like the one that uh, we're emulating, Heart, and you got. Uh, one billion dollars a mile, and uh, I calculated. I stood and stayed up all night calculating times twenty, uh, and it's twenty billion dollars. I just don't. I wonder why no one's talking about twenty billion dollars. Is it just because it's allocated in such a uh, maintenance and you know whatever? But it's. I mean, how can we do anything cheaper than California? Good question. Thank you. Maybe someone could respond to that. The difference between the announced price of the rail and the actual cost that it's going to. Um, well, we, every project has, uh, you know, reasonable overages, and of course the biggest surprise was in, in uh, California, that <laughs> because the, the, the figures there are awesome. Um, unfortunately, you know, our project is very much taxpayer financed. Uh, the feds have given us only $1.5 billion, all the rest is ours. So we have to be extremely careful about that. And as far as the per mile cost and all, we really don't know because the fat lady hasn't completely signed yet. I mean, the, the project is about 45% built, so there is a lot of room for a lot more bad news, unfortunately. All right, thank you, Randy. Lonnie, good to see you today. Hi. Uh, aloha, I'm Lonnie Kaaha. 
Thank you so much for coming. Um, I just have a question for Councilmember Sunayoshi. I was very um, listening carefully to what you said, and uh, one of the things you said is we've had several audits that have shown a challenge in internal controls uh, since 2009. So for the last 10 years, the City Council has had a chance to do something about it. Um, and uh, we in the public are one step away from being able to do anything about it, and we count on our City Council to um, stand up for us. Um, is our current city council, uh, after this forensic audit, have the political courage uh, to stand up for the public and stop this um, confusion in internal controls um, so that we don't see the skyrocketing costs with no answers? Go ahead. Talk about your fears. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good that's a good question. Oops. Nobody wants to hear about my peers. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's up. Use Randy's mic. Okay. That's a good question, and um, thank you for asking that question. Um, being the freshman council member, it has been a very interesting journey thus far, only a few months in. And I have to say that it was um, concerning to me as well that since 2009 we've heard the same thing, so 10 years later. I just have to say that I'm hopeful in the fact that the um, council members did rally around the resolution for the forensic audit, and it's the first time that a forensic audit resolution got to the floor and did make it out. So um, my older daughter's name is Hope, and so I just have to remain hopeful that um, the, the, the powers that be are going to see that the people are at that point where they're calling for accountability and transparency and that they do choose to do the right thing. I can only speak for myself personally, and I, I did always tell myself if I was elected, I would always remain true to the voice of the people. So I can say that I will remain true to that, And um, although there is a lot that goes into these things and decisions and meetings, that I will remain true to really rally for the people's voice, and hopefully that um, we all come together for that. Thank you very Thank much. You. Well, now we've got time for just the last four people who are standing in line. And before we do that, I just want to draw your attention to a couple of things. If you're new to us, we'd love you to get our regular newsletter, which goes out in the mail, as well as our weekly videos and our weekly news releases and so forth. Would you just fill out a card on your table and leave your comments as well? We'd love to share your comments with our speakers today. So if you find that card on your table if you're new here, when you're done with it, I just want to reintroduce the two people to whom to give it. Either Christy, if you'll stand up over there, she'll we'd love to get your card. Or Sean, who's in the back of the room over there. Now is our final four questioners. Ma'am, would you kindly come to the microphone and introduce yourself? Aloha. Aloha. My name is Loretta Scheiber. I'm a retired senior citizen on a fixed income. And so this question is for Mr. Panos. For many years, I've asked the same question. In 1997, I moved to Oahu and I was paying eight, nine, ten cents per kilowatt for my home residential. In 2011, when I checked the last time, it was at 37 cents a kilowatt. Since this is an electric train, what would be the cost of electricity to run these engines, these big engines? It's the first question, to and from. Um, Destination. The second question is, um, I, I'm for leaving it at Middle Street for one reason. These big engines that have start and go, start and go, Mr. Thomas. How does that affect power quality in the downtown area where you have buildings that were built in 1970 based on an old utility structure? And Hawaiian Electric is doing a wonderful job in upgrading it. However, our buildings need to be upgraded in protection for power quality. Because the stop and go of these electric engines, my personal opinion, causes harmonics. How is that going to affect the computer systems we have in our desktop computers, in our $35,000 air conditioning computers, run these buildings, that's a real concern. Never got an answer. Thank you very much. Right. Well, you're asking the right person now. Yeah. Uh, I think that the threat of harmonics is uh, relatively small. We 
already have neighborhoods next to giant transformers and there is very little interference and very little evidence that the giant transformers actually uh, create any major uh, health, uh, health effects. Um, for reasons of cleanliness, in other words, getting rid of the pollution, uh, throughout the world, the world is moving towards electrification. So our few, already our buses are hybrid and future buses, more of them uh, will be electric. If you go to cities like uh, Seoul, Korea, uh, most of their buses are already electric. Los Angeles is moving in that direction. Now your first question is also very important. Yes, indeed, it's an electric train. It's gonna be very hungry. Uh, unfortunately, it's okay to be hungry because if you do productive work, you gotta pay for it. Unfortunately, two thirds of the day, that thing is gonna be going back and forth almost empty. Uh, now the engineering design for it is for an additional 30 megawatt of added power. And when, um, Colleen Hanabusa was a, a head at heart, they asked her that question, who pays for that electricity? And she gave a Hillary Clinton type of answer. It doesn't really matter. Either you're gonna pay it through your rail tax or you're gonna pay it through your HECO tax. So either way, we're gonna have an additional 30 megawatt of power necessary to power the train, particularly around the 5, 6 p.m. when we all take showers, cook and whatever, and the rain the train is, is running short getaways to take people back home. So, yeah? Well, thank you. More costs. Now, a couple more questions. Sir? Well, <coughs> excuse me. My name is Bob Hampton. I, too, am Kate Okaya. I did want, before I get my question to Anita, Councilwoman, an irony. Um, this had to be back in the early 70s. Bob, you may remember when we did our exchange club meetings right in this room. And one of our speakers was Kiko uh, Kapwek in Bronner, Renee Ranch, and Mancho. And where she would be needed. Rain, yeah, rain, rain. Um, my question really is a question that I have 70 employees that they don't mind those. And I know the ones that live in Eva are probably asking this question. How much do you think it will cost them to ride the rail from home to work? Thank you. Thank you for the question. That's, oh, yeah, this is still, that's a very good question. And that's um, another question that we're trying to get answers to within the budget um, proposals coming up. There's, um, there was a line item for a consultant who's going to be determining the rates, which was ironic to me because we're hiring a consultant to decide the rates at $6.7 billion of different consultants to um, decide the rate. So that is a very fair question. The answer is we don't know yet. They haven't set their rate for what the rail will be. There's a lot of discussion about a holo card and um, even that is very confusing as Mr. Roth was saying where you were saying the confusion is the kind of the ingredient to all this chaos. There's more confusion on the rates as well now with the introduction of a holo card and the, the bus and the, and the rail rate will be all on this holo card. So the answer is we don't know yet and that is a very important question to have for the ridership. So for me, before we can even decide what our ridership is going to be like, we should know the cost so that we know how many people can afford to ride that. And um, that's another good question that we need answers to. Very good. Thank you. Nancy? Hi, I'm Nancy Nagamini. And I don't know if you remember me. I was standing out there 12 years ago with signs that said, stop rail now. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, and then I'd go into the bathroom and somewhere and change clothes and go to work. And go back and go to the stop rail office. Unfortunately, none of our efforts worked. Um, and I feel like every day now, it's I, when I wake up and read the news, it's like deja vu. It's, this is, everything that's happening is exactly what Cliff and Panos and everybody predicted was going to happen. And so it's really no surprise. Anyway, my question for uh, Councilwoman, can I call you Heidi? Sorry. <laughs> um, the timeline on this forensic audit is sort of a multi-question. Multi the timeline, start, finish. Is it a done deal? Is it really going to happen? And what will happen if fraud is uncovered? Are there consequences for those people who cause the fraud? Thank you. Heidi, quickly, please. Thank you. That's a good question. So the, with regards to the timeline, it has been budgeted. And so we're going through our budget process that ends on June 5th. 
So once the budget is finalized and that money is still retained in the, in the budget, then we have to go through um, getting that money released by the administration. So it's going to um, probably be at least another five to six months to get the money released and then um, really pinning down what we're, we're going to be working with the city auditor to, to put in the proposal as to what we're going to look to. But as far as um, where I'm concerned and we'll be working with the council members and administration on is that time is of the essence. Because the longer it takes for the investigation, the longer and more money will be continued to be spent. So we're going to try to get that on track as soon as possible. And then with regards to the second question as far as what will be the consequences, um, we are really looking to specify that this is, has an investigative quality to it to look for any purposeful and criminal behavior. So once that is uncovered, then we would then be turning it over to the appropriate authorities to, um, for their action for consequences. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our final question, sir, if you'll come to the microphone. Hi, my name is John Jones. And I'm wondering, um, I'm thinking the future is going to um, stop rail, and there's nothing that anybody else can do with it because after the we're self driving vehicles, electric vehicles, and monthly subscription services, uh, probably half of the vehicles on the Waffle will go away in the next 10 years. And probably by the time rail starts, It'll already be obsolete, like panelists had talked about. And under that scenario, why would anybody uh, with, with a brain invest in a public partner private uh, partnership on a, something that's going to be a white elephant by 2030? All right, thank you for your question. We'll let, in fact, we'll let each one of you respond, and you can also say your farewell comment briefly. Uh, several, several people have said something about how the, the Ubers and, and Lyfts of the world have, have been changing things, and, and certainly nationally. Here in Hawaii, since 2014, the average number of rides per month on the bus has gone down by one million. One million rides per month. And Roger Morton, who's in charge of, of the bus, and I think does a terrific job, uh, has speculated that a number of causes, but at the top, um, this change that is a, a permanent change, if you will. This is important for a, a lot of reasons, including the bulk of rail riders are projected to get there um, by bus. And to the extent that bus ridership is changing significantly, and not in a cyclical, but in a, a systematic sort of, of way, a structural way, you would think there would be some adjustment to the ridership of the bus calculations, and there hasn't at all, which by itself says, says a lot. Uh, to me, when you take everything that's been said today and asked today and you put it together, what it comes down to is going forward, what we can do is do a forensic audit where we really find out what's gone wrong and why and then have some accountability. And going forward, we need to stop at Middle Street. Please Thank you. So addressing the question of the future, I think in the next 20, 30 years, as we look at the basic transportation in Honolulu, there will be a lot of automation, and there will be the rail. Unfortunately, the city, by the way that they are signing their contracts, they have wedded themselves to the rail for the next 20 to 30 years. After that, it's a long time to predict. So the victim in the whole story will be our beloved bus. Once upon a time, one of the top three systems in North America and performing well for years, uh, we are actively killing it. And of course, the moment, as Randy says, that, that the bus opens, 30 routes will be eliminated or truncated to feed the rail. And my concluding um, piece of information for all of you is a, a there, there is a lot of misunderstanding out there of what it costs to use transit. And many of us think it's going to be two bucks or three bucks. No. Today, the average cost per trip on the bus is between $8 and $11, of, of which only $2.50 is recovered. Once the train starts operating, depending on the ridership, the average cost per ride will be between $25 to $35, of which $3 to $4 will be recovered. And that's the truth, and we're not going to be unique in the nation. That's what these systems actually cost. Unless you use them like sardines in Japan, you are never going to break even because they are very, very expensive. Thank you, Professor Prevederos. Give him a big hand. Thank you. Thank
Thank you. And to that question, my final um, words would be to say that that's exactly um, my concern that was just discussed is that why would anybody come into a system that in 20 to 30 years might be obsolete? And that's exactly my concern for the P3, which is that no matter what happens, if we do sign on to agree to this P3, it will be for 30 years of operation and maintenance. And the individual who's awarded the contract will get paid no matter what. So like was said earlier, the city taxpayers will get paid and um, will be held holding the bag for, many, for decades, so for 30 years. And no matter what their ridership is, they'll be getting their payment. So that was my concern that I did bring up in committee is that does that depend? Is there any ridership clause in the operation and maintenance component of the P3 that says to be able to get paid, you have to maintain a certain level of ridership, and there is none? which is a big concern for me because then the less ridership and as we we're saying, the mode of transportation will most likely change within the next 20 to 30 years, but no matter what, the taxpayers will be left holding the bag if we move forward on the P3. So my closing remarks is just thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you folks this afternoon. I really appreciate the opportunity and to be on such an esteemed panel. I really appreciate that and Dr. Akina for the opportunity. And just closing remarks to say that I'll continue to try to get the answers that you deserve as taxpayers that our future generations of taxpayers deserve and make sure that we make good decisions based on solid information and not mythical um, abstract storylines, which has been what has happened so far. Thank you. Before we say goodbye to our panelists, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you members of the Grassroot Institute and your guests. Delighted to have you here today. If you enjoyed today's presentation, make sure that you fill out one of these cards that will automatically send you a copy of it and stop by the desk here and consider becoming a member. But we're just delighted to have you here. You make grassroots possible here in the state to make it a better place to live. And I want to thank you for being with us today. Please give another big hand of applause.